go ahead and get started. People are still coming in, but hi, good morning. This is Lyle Hanna, and uh, welcome to Life During COVID-19 Shutdown. How many of you are really shut down? I think a lot of people are really working hard, even from home or wherever. <laughs> but what are the real Kentucky comp companies facing right now? We're going to hear from four of them today and hear about some other ones. So uh, I'm Lyle Hanna. We're just delighted you could join us. And uh, as our governor says, we're going to get through this together. And uh, today we've got some great updates. Uh, let's flip over to the first slide and we'll jump right in here. Um, you, you know, we've got Jim Morris back. If, you, if you've joined us on some of these other calls, you know he's an attorney and has been very, very helpful. Uh, he's got his degree from UK and he's licensed to practice all over the place, Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, Texas, Pennsylvania, and the District of Columbia, and the U.S. Supreme Court. A lot of experience and we, we brought him in because he had experience with COVID-19 cases well before most other people with some major employers around the country. And so he was just ahead of the game and we started working with him and he's been very helpful and uh, kind of getting a handle on all of the challenge that we face. Update today, and I know you guys are looking forward to that. I'm also assisted by our Able Body team. You know, we run HR for over a dozen companies, so we get a lot of exposure. Uh, Allison Petrie works with a major uh, company that is a, uh, a medical uh, testing company, so you can imagine they've got a lot going on. Uh, Chase Adams is on here and he runs HR for one of his clients is the Kentucky Bar Association. And of course, they know everything. So you can imagine keeping up with that's a lot of fun. And Autumn Morris is on here and she runs HR for several companies too. So uh, they're going to share some of their experiences with you. Um, but uh, we're going to start out today. I hope both these guys are on here. I heard, I heard Muncie was on here. Flip to the next slide, Jim, and we'll jump right in with... Uh, uh, oops, I'll go back to that agenda. I slipped over the agenda. Let me tell you all. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start with unemployment issues. Then we're going to give you this update from four different companies across the Commonwealth. And then we're going to, Jim's going to give us the legal update on employment issues. I see uh, uh, he, a lot of things are still changing, but not as many as there were. So it's not as fast and furious as it was. So he's got a few important things to share with us. And then we've got some three C's, just some ways to wrap up about thinking about things that we think are good practices and then we're going to take questions and answers and you know what you can put them down on the chat below anytime we're recording them and we we like to keep this interactive so don't hesitate to uh, fire your questions in any time if we can deal with them while the speakers are speaking we will certainly do that well, let's look at that next slide and we've got two real experts in this state these guys have become very popular in the past few months uh, Josh Benton, I hope he's on here. He's the Deputy Secretary of the Kentucky Education and Workforce Development Cabinet. A super guy. He's speaking all across the Commonwealth on a regular basis. Um, master's degree from Kentucky State University, and he's a Kentucky guy. And so he's going to share some of the uh, stuff about unemployment because everybody's sort of dealing with those programs right now. But he's also joined by uh, Muncie McNamara. And I heard Muncie chime in a minute ago, so I know he's on here. He is. How would you like this job right now? The executive director of the Office of Unemployment. He oversees 170 people in Frankfurt. I bet you it's more than that now. I hear people are volunteering from across the, the Commonwealth to help out. But, uh, you know, he is an attorney. He uh, practiced in his own law firm for quite a while. Went to school out in, in uh, Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. and uh, worked for a congressman there. Just a super guy. We're glad you guys are on board. Josh and Muncie, why don't you all take it away? So um, I'm I'm not I'm not I'm not sure if the uh, deputy secretary is on this call or not. Uh, he was he got uh, pulled into something here a minute ago. He might chime in later. But yes, uh, thank you guys. I'm I'm happy to be here. My name is Muncie McNamara, and I'm the executive director of uh, unemployment and. Um, you know, I'm I'm here to answer your guys' questions about uh, what, <laughs> all this crazy stuff that's going on. Um, you know, we've got uh, we've got a new a whole bunch of new stuff here that the federal government has established. We have state um, we have state unemployment insurance, um, and then we have uh, pandemic unemployment assistance, 
We have federal uh, emergency pandemic unemployment assistance, and we have uh, uh, the FPUC. So the FPUC is the $600. Um, that's the thing that we have to give to everybody that gets $1 of any other kind of unemployment assistance. Um, the PUA is a, um, it, it covers basically everybody that was not otherwise uh, eligible for unemployment prior to this whole COVID-19 thing. Um, so we're covering most everybody. Um, from an employer's perspective, look, I want to make it very clear that we are, we are trying to cover all these individuals and trying to take care of all the individuals, but we are also very mindful of our employers here in this state because everybody's going to have to open back up at some point. And so for this time period in quarter two, we are uh, not charging to the uh, employer accounts for chargeability. And we're, we're looking, it looks like we're going to um, not charge reimbursing employers. Um, so that's kind of the general overview of what we're doing. Um, I would like to make everybody aware of the fact that we have a mass claims um, uh, system. So if you're going to be laying off, if you have at least 50 employees and you're going to be laying off at least 15 people, then we would ask that you please file a mass claim um, our, the email for that is um, uieclaims at ky.gov. Um, my people there are uh, Megan Mitchell and Becky Tabor. Um, they are wonderful. We can do mass claims. And we are, I am in the process of starting, a, starting up a, a work share program. Um, the Deputy Secretary, Secretary has just joined me of starting up a work share program, which is a reduction in hours kind of program. Um, and so we're, we're, we're trying, if you guys need to reduce hours as opposed to laying people off, we're going to be able to handle that as well. So Josh, uh, Josh, just join me. Do you have anything to say, Josh? Yeah, sorry, folks. I um, kind of get pulled in a couple different directions this morning. So I uh, apologize for not being on the call um, initially. Um, you know, Muncie is going to provide the majority of the details to the questions and things that, that were provided, but I think we just want to, uh, the simple message being that, one, we're very, you know, appreciative of, of the opportunity to, to address the group today. Um, obviously, we think this is a really good way to address a lot of questions at once and um, an opportunity to um, just to, to share to a large group about um, a lot of the changes uh, that are going on with unemployment insurance right now, specifically those things that impact employers, um, and to talk about the, the different flexibilities and, and processes that are taking place. So we're appreciative of uh, that opportunity. Um, it, it allows us to just get consistent information out to, to everybody at the same time. Um, Muncie is going to, you know, like I, I mentioned, take uh, kind of take the reins on this. As you know, I'm, as I, I guess, getting pulled into a couple different directions this morning, so I apologize. I can't uh, join for the entirety, but you're in good hands with Muncie. Um, he he knows the ins and outs of this uh, more so than anybody else, and so um, you know he'll he'll be able to provide some clarity to those questions. But thanks again uh, for the opportunity for us to join you today. You so bet. I'm, Glad you're here. Sorry, Long. No, no. I was Go just going to ask a question of uh, one or the other. Uh, this is Jim Morris. I've got several clients that have asked some interrelated questions about the interplay between the federal and the state. And also, I'm going to ask you to give the website again because we've had a couple people ask. But the questions I've, I've had are, so we have people who were uh, laid off last week in some companies, and I know that as of Friday of last week, the notice going out was that they would receive their first state unemployment insurance 
check on April 23rd. And I know that the federal is tied to it, but not in the same check. So how long are they having to wait for the federal? That's one. When they get their check on April 23rd in the state, is that going to be back payment backdated to the date that they became unemployed? That's the second question I've gotten a lot of. And the third one, I think you may have answered, but I think it's critical, so I'd like to have it repeated for everybody. Uh, even if somebody receives $1 of unemployment insurance from the state of Kentucky, they receive an additional $600 from the federal government. Uh, is that correct? And those were the, the questions along with that website for the mass layoff. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, let's start with the $600. Yes. If you get $1, if you're eligible for any of the programs, you get $1, you get the $600. That's correct. That That's the part of the federal program. Um, the website, so the website to do an individual application is kcc.ky.gov. The email for a mass claim is uieclaims, plural, all one word, word at ky.gov, okay? Um, sorry, go ahead. No, it's uh, the other, I just put it up on the screen, the individual claim, I happen to have it out. So I just was showing everybody where the individual claims would be. Um, this is where they start and they have to click on I agree uh, at the bottom. And one of the questions that I've had, and I got this last week from several of my employers, is that the system seems to be crashing or too busy and I've told people to just keep clicking on it over and over again until they can get through because there are so many people that are trying to log in and do it simultaneously. So uh, I, I can address the system issue. I mean, we have not had the system crash in over three weeks. Um, I think there are instances when um, when there are, so I don't say this, if the system were to crash, uh, there would be an alternate application that would immediately pop up for for folks to use. This is the message. Now, they're, this is the message they're getting. I just moved it onto the screen because I just clicked on it and I just received it literally timed to this second. The server you're trying to access is either busy or experiencing difficulties. Please close the web browser, open a new web browser, and try logging in again. And so this happens, I was trying to assist an employer last week. This is the crashing that's happening when you click on I agree on the page prior. Uh, I would say that is a result of, of the system being busy. We can run that by our um, IT folks uh, to, uh, to, to make them aware that that's the message, but my, um, my understanding is that um, that that may be an indication that the system's running slow um, because of high volume. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, in terms of it actually crashing and not being available, um, it's been a significant amount of time since that's happened. Um, so. Uh, but I can run that by our IT team and let them know that that message is popping up and, and you know, obviously we can see if we can you know, provide additional assistance for that. Yeah, I mean, we, we have increased our capacity on the computers like 10 times. Uh, I figure. <laughs> what, what, it, what it started off as, and, and, and on the phone lines also, you know, we've been continually adding capacity, but we've... The volume of claims, is, new claims that we've received is a thousand times what we normally do. I mean, literally, I think it's actually 3,000 times what we normally get. And so, you know, the computer system is uh, overwhelmed and we, we just keep trying to add capacity. But yeah, that's probably going to be an issue. Um, and we're, we're, at every moment, we're trying to make it better. So the other two, I, I just, and that wasn't a complaint. I was just letting you know. Uh, no, understood. I, yeah, no, I got you. Understood. Um, and I know that, you know, 
I think you went from 12 employees to 1,200 employees to try to cover the, I read something about that, just to yeah, try to right. cover the amount of uh, applications. It's insane. So, again, you guys, <laughs> yeah, that's just the phone lines. That's just right. the phone lines. You're doing an incredible job, so I'm not trying to, please understand that wasn't oh, trying sure. to, to attack. The question. No, 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 you're fine. The other question, uh, going back to that list, was the uh, federal check not being tied to the state. Are you all, when somebody applies and they have to wait till April 23rd for the state, do you know how long it's taking to, for Fridays? Uh, yeah. Do you know how long it's taking to get the uh, federal check? So we just started processing the federal checks on Thursday evening last week. Um, but the, when we're caught up, um, here is how you know this will will run. Um, all of those funds are are flowing through our system in our office, um, and when someone, uh, I guess the best way to frame this is that you know we run payroll every two weeks uh, for uh, for UI. Yes. And it is for the two previous weeks. Yes. So what someone will receive, first of all, is their regular benefit. And then with a day, within a day or two, they will receive the additional federal benefit. So the additional $600 is always going to follow uh, their state payment uh, for their normal benefit. So they're coming in two separate payments. Okay, they're coming in two separate payments, so we can track those. And the the six hundred dollars, the FPUC is going to run like a day behind. But the, so they're going to get the underlying UI benefit, state or federal, because there's both programs going on. And then the six hundred dollars is going to run concurrent, but a day behind. Okay. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, and this is Allison Petri here. So I wanted to see if you all wouldn't care to expound a little bit on the work share program. That's where I'm getting a lot of my questions. And people want to know kind of if there's a certain amount of hours they have to be reduced or a loss percentage before they qualify. And just any other details we could know about that program. Yeah, sure thing. So I'm hoping to have this up and running this week. Okay. Um, we, Kentucky has never had a work share program, a pure work share program. We've had a partial unemployment benefit program, uh, but the federal, the CARES Act um, uh, encouraged us to start a work share program, and so I've done that. Um, and the way work share works is you can reduce hours across the board. It has to be at least 10%, no more than 60%, and then they will get the equivalent um, benefit. So if you reduce uh, hours across the board by 20%, for example, then those people will get 20% of their uh, underlying uh, unemployment benefit. And then the $600 also. <laughs> so, okay. so does that make sense? People, yeah, absolutely. And so for people that have already had their hours reduced, have already been applying, are they eligible for the partial unemployment until this is set up or will they? Yeah, 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 yes. I mean, everybody. we're gonna try and move everybody into the work share program. Um, what, what I would like is we're working through our um, e-claim system also. We're going to collect all the people and we're going to do a mass filing. So we have set up um, workshare at ky.gov and I would like you to email that a list just like a, a mass claim. Email me the, the you know, list of people that are um, you're going to reduce their hours, and then we will set up claims for them. That's what we are working on doing, and we're going to have that set up this week. So, yeah. Right. Um, okay. What? How do employers handle, or how do you all handle, I guess, commissioned employees? Um, a lot of them have been coming to their employers with questions about what they're eligible for, or what what we need to report. So, I just kind of want to make sure we're handling those. So, if, if, uh, if they're commissioned, you're going to have to clarify this for me. If they're commissioned, is this like they're independent contractors and they're commissioned? Yes. Well, okay. they're, they're, and, they're sorry, the majority of, um, sorry, they're employees, but the majority of their pay comes from commissions. So they have maybe a very low or no base, um, and most of their pay comes from commissions, from sales. Okay. So are they still, are you going to keep them on, or are they, like, just on their own now? I mean, they would be covered under PUA, 
or mm-hmm. they'd be covered under work share if it's a reduction. It, like, if they if they lose that, they're obvious, they're probably not working as much, so they'd be covered under work share, or they'd be covered under PUA. PUA is for um, people who are otherwise not covered by unemployment benefits, and that's that's the federal program. It's a hundred percent federally funded, um, so they would they would be covered under that. Okay. Independent contractors, self-employed, those kind of people are covered under that. Perfect. Okay. All right. And as um, as employer representatives, how can we help you all when we are responding to these claims? Is there something that we can do to expedite your processing to make it easier? Um, other than the e-claim that you talked about for larger layoffs, like if we're just laying off a few people. Is there yeah, well, so the work, the work share is going to be a big thing because um, I, I think that a lot of smaller businesses are in, in particular are going to just want to cut hours for people, and so the work share is going to be a big thing. Um, you're going to get a employer protest letter. If you have individuals that uh, file, you're going to get an employer protest letter, um, and you can expedite it by just sending it back in, even if you're not going to protest it. You can expedite the claim by just sending it back in and say, I don't protest it. Because uh, we have to wait 10 days for you guys to respond. Um, and so if we get that back sooner, then we can move on and pay the individual claim. Um, but we have to wait 10 days if we don't get that back. Right. I'm looking down the list of questions. So if anyone ha- else has one, feel free to chime in. But I know well, we've and got a lot. <laughs> Muncie, you were kind of on a roll before Josh joined us, and you, we stopped you. So if there are general things you wanted to say, you saw that list of questions, too. If you want to jump back in and uh, uh, speak a little bit, we're, we're getting questions as we go. So, Well, I'm happy to answer individual questions. Again, we are uh, finalizing also, I hope, today, we are finalizing a employer handbook. You know, we've always had an employer handbook, but this is going to be a – specific COVID, all this crazy stuff, employer handbook, and we're going to put it on the website so you guys can go look for that. I'm hoping that's going to get done today. I'll be honest with you, I've had that thing ready to go, and our communications team keeps wanting to futz with it, uh, but I'm ready to have that put up there right now. <laughs> so hopefully that will answer a lot of these questions for you. I've got a question, I've got a question for you that uh, yes, we've been asked for the last three seminar or webinars that we've done yes, sir. and it's been asked again today so I'm going to throw it out there as it's been asked there yes. the problem and this was kind of pinpointed by uh, uh, Senator Graham out of South Carolina back in <laughs> I know exactly what the question is but please go ahead and ask it I know exactly what the question is yeah People are being people are being paid more to stay at home on unemployment than they are if they work, and so yeah, yeah. now people are angry with their employers when they call yeah, and yeah. say, "I have work for you to do," and they're wanting to not work because they'll be paid more to stay at home. How yeah, yeah. how in the world are regular Kentucky employers going to be able to handle that? For yep. anyone who made less than, if you run the calculations, it's like forty-two thousand dollars a year. Yes. Yeah, it's, yeah, it makes it impossible to get anybody to work. Yes, I have an answer. This, <laughs> uh, I do have an answer. I do have an answer. Um, it, it's a multi-party answer, but I think you will, I think you will like the answer. Okay, so um, first of all. This, the $600 is, was a federal benefit. That came under the CARES Act, okay? The states didn't ask for this. Uh, we certainly didn't, and no other state. I'm in contact with all of my, my peers in every single state. No one asked for this. It was, it was something, let's be honest, it, it was a, it's a stimulus check that they tried to shoehorn into UI, okay? Uh, it was probably the inappropriate way to do it. It was because it, it, of all the work stuff, but... Here's the answer, okay? So um, if, if somebody has a reasonable fear of exposure to COVID-19 by exposure in the workplace, then they are covered. However, however, this is a big however, if, you're, if the employer makes reasonable accommodations or offers telework and then offers work, 
then the employee has to accept that. Reasonable accommodations is the big part here. That's uh, going to be a situational and fact-specific thing. But, you know, if you're doing stuff like social distancing in your workplace and your employee says, well, I'm still, you know, I still don't want to, you know, show up to work and you offer them work, well, that's the kind of stuff that we're going to look at and you can't just quit. And we are going to probably, you know, we're going to look at it and deem that a quit. So you can tell your employees if they have a good job that uh, if they want to roll the dice and quit, and, and we might find that we might find it a quit and then they won't get anything. So does that answer the question? Absolutely. And that's the question that has been asked. And I think that everybody has been afraid to dispute the uh, UI claim, but I think every employer everybody gets, everybody gets, every employer gets this employer protest form. Okay. So if your employee says, Oh no, I was, I just had to self quarantine and you write back to us and you say, no, I offered them work, and here are the steps that I did to mitigate, you know, COVID exposure. Then we're going to consider that, and so that's we're still taking those employer protest forms. You'll get that letter if you know. So you need to fill that out, and you need to send it back and tell us what you did. That that's excellent to hear that that's the stance being taken. The, from an attorney's perspective, on behalf of uh, a lot of these employers, uh, that's huge. I appreciate yeah. that. I'm in a journey too. And so, you know, reasonable measures, you know, reasonable accommodations. We're working on putting some guidance together for our adjudicators, but it's mostly going to be based around, you know, social distancing and stuff like that. So, you know, we've got to put some stuff in place so that our adjudicators and if, if they appeal, you know, they have standards. And I get that, obviously, because I'm a lawyer. So we're working on putting that in place. But it's not a blanket. Everybody can just go home and quit working. That, that is definitely not what Excellent. Thank you. Sorry, Lyle. Welcome. Those those are questions I'm getting every day. Yeah, absolutely. I know that. Yeah. Yeah. Keep them coming. We're gonna let's take a few more and then we'll move along. Absolutely. Okay. So we did get a question about um, responding to e claims. So there was no place to enter wages for the individuals. How are their benefits amounts calculated? On, on the e-claims, there there's absolutely should be a way to enter wages. It's a, it's a mass claim. So that we send a spreadsheet out to everybody. If somebody's got a specific issue and they haven't gotten the correct spreadsheet, then they need to email. Look, my email is m-u-n-c-i-e dot McNamara, M-C-N-A-M-A-R-A at K-Y dot gov. If somebody has a specific issue with their, you know, with their e-claim, then send it to me and I'll get with my e-claims people or they can e email the UIE claims at ky.gov. But that's a specific company problem and if they're having that problem, then they need to just contact me. Perfect. Wonderful. Um, and then we had someone just wanted to be a thousand percent clear. So if you reduce your employee's hours by less than 10 percent, they're not eligible for unemployment benefits. Work share is 10 percent. Work share is 10% to 60%. No more than 60% because then you might as well just be doing a layoff at at least 10%. Got it. And that's, that's pretty, that's national standards. Well, and we have people that are doing a day a week, so they would qualify. Yeah, 10, 10 to 60, you know. So you can reduce your hours at least 10%, you know, no more than 60%. And we're going we're gonna to do that. Wow, okay. That's awesome. Anything else, Allison or Chase? Autumn. So, um, so we do have a question. If the employee is already on unemployment but is called back to work and doesn't return, how would that, what's the best way to notify you? Um, so that's, that's, that's the employment. <laughs> well, that's, that's actually incumbent on the employee. Uh, if they're reporting wages or if they're not reporting wages when they go um, claim their benefits, then that's fraud and we will figure that out and then they will be assessed the fraud ch charge and they sh they don't want that <laughs> that's a crime <laughs> all right let's see and then so regarding mass claims so i think we've kind of answered that if employees are still or employers are still having issues with that system to just reach out to the emails you provided because we've got a couple of questions yes. just about error messages. anybody that's having problems with mass claims look we, we're getting i mean this sounds like an excuse but it, it 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 is 
the fact of the matter is that we, our systems are taxed. They're overly taxed. Everything is overly taxed. We've gotten, you know, we're, we're used to getting 10,000 claims a month and we've gotten 300,000 claims last month. So, uh, I mean, 360,000 claims through yesterday. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, the systems are taxed. If people are having problems, I understand that. I'm sorry. They just need to reach out to me or reach out to the e-claims and we will try and take care of it. Um, and then this one, we might need Jim to weigh in a little bit on this too, because we had an, an employer ask, and they have reduced their salaried employee salaries. Um, are are they eligible for unemployment or PUA for any part of that loss of income? No, but salaried employees are different, unfortunately. Salaried employees are different. The big star, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but salaries are different. I do have a follow-up on that. So yes. salaried employees, if you are reducing their, uh, if you want to do a work share for them at all, um, you're not able to do any work share for a salaried employee? Sal salaried employees are different. I mean, you know, I what, what, we cover, yeah. what we cover is wage and hours, you know. Um, but again, you're an attorney. I remember when Frostbound Todd, when my wife first started working there, they said, you know, during the recession, uh, they said they came and they're like, we're cutting salaries by 20% across the board. And they just made that announcement and they're salaried. And that's, you can do that. There's a difference between salaries and wage and hours. Yeah, I just, I wanted to clarify that because there's a lot of people looking at laying off or reducing hours for salaried. And I think it's critical for people to know that yeah. you're looking at hourly employees and wages, and so they run into a problem in trying to uh, apply yeah. the same 10% to 60% of a salaried employee. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, we, salaried employees are just different. I mean, it is, it's just a different thing, you know, you get the, the benefit of being a salaried employee is you get paid whether or not you show up to work or not, you get a salary. Um, unlike wage an hour, that's the benefit. Now, this is the drawback. We're seeing the drawback right now. And that's the same thing, just so everybody understands. We talked about this, I think, in week two, which was two weeks ago. The CARES Act draws a distinction between hourly and uh, salaried employees as well. Yeah. Uh, for this very reason, they talk about yeah. how salaried employees, you get paid whether you show up or not, so you have to look at it differently on a salary than lay people off or furlough them uh, versus, versus an hourly employee where you're just cutting people back. Yes, that's correct. Hi, Muncie. This is John Petrov. Just to clarify, though, and James, if, if a salaried employee is furloughed for a week or two weeks, they would be covered for partial benefits, correct? If, if they're salaried, they should doesn't matter if you lay them off. I mean, if they're salaried, they have a, they should have a contract. They get paid one way or the other. That's not a salaried employee. That's a wage an hour. Well, he's, he's saying though that he's not paying them. He's going to furlough them and not give them a salary. In that instance, at least now that we may have a legal disagreement here, but I would argue that that person, if they truly are being laid off temporarily and not receiving a paycheck because of this, well, then they can apply. Then they can apply, and they right. would probably fall under PUA. Yeah. Okay. But that 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 sounds. Uh, yeah, I mean, that sounds. Look, that's not my shop. That's a Department of Labor shop, but a salary is like a contract. You can't just. <laughs> but I don't want to. It's fine. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, the way that uh, you are getting into a contract issue there, uh, Muncie. But the the reason why I say that is. This is an unprecedented situation, which I hear yeah, over and over. Of course, of but course. if you are literally telling somebody for two weeks you will not receive your salary, you have two choices: you can either quit on me, or you can come back in two weeks. But then they can, can they can apply for public they can apply for PUA, and we will cover them under PUA. Right. That's that's my position on that as well. Yes. Yes. That's, that's our excellent position. question, John. Yeah, that is a good question. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. All right, so one last question, and I think you, the answer might just be it's going to be in the employer handbook, but we've got a lot of 
um, questions about how to actually calculate the benefits an employee is eligible for because people are getting questions. Um, okay, well, let me tell you two things about that. One, there's a benefit calculator for the individuals, but second of all, employers should not be worried about this right now. We are not charging individual employer reserve accounts, and we're not charging reimbursing employers. We're going to, for quarter two. So we're going to, we are, you know, there's two parts here. We want, we want to help the individuals, and we want to cover every single person, but we're also trying to help our small businesses and our big businesses. It doesn't matter. Like, our businesses generally because they're going to have to reopen at some point, and they don't need to be burdened. And so they shouldn't, employers shouldn't worry about what the benefits are going to cost because we're not charging their reserve accounts. It's not going to affect their, any, any, our goal here is to, any effect on their chargeability is going to be negligible. And the reimbursers, the nonprofits, the hospitals, things like that, the schools, we're not going to, we're not going to charge them. So. Yeah. It Allison, their problem wasn't what the company was being charged. They were wondering what the employee would receive. Is that right? Or so, so the actual question is just, can someone explain how benefits are calculated for employees that have been furloughed one day a week? Are they eligible to a certain amount of loss percentage? So I think we've addressed parts of it, but... What, one, one day a week is work share. That's a reduction in hours. If they're just going to like, we're going to work Monday through Thursday and close down on Friday, that's a 20% cut in hours. That's work share and they need to contact me and we're going to, we're getting that program set up this week. And that's only for non-exempt employees. Is that right? Or can exempt and non-exempt employees qualify? Seems like what you said a minute ago, exempts would not qualify. That's hourly employees. Yeah, yeah it's hourly employees. That's right. Yeah. Okay because salaried employees are getting paid unless, like John said, they're actually being laid off or furloughed for a time period, then they're getting Correct. paid whether they work one day or four days or five. They Correct. Be, you shouldn't be able to dock because of FLSA. You shouldn't be able to dock an, an, a salaried employee, an exempt employee, one day a week. No, you can't, Lyle. It's only in a, a, it has to be in a full work week increment under FLSA. Got, got it. I agree. Okay. You guys have done a super job. Josh, thank you for being here. Muncie. Josh, how'd you take off? <laughs> I'm just here. <laughs> okay. Well, I thought I was, be, I, I should be polite about it. Uh, you are super. We're going to, we're going to nominate you, you for, for an award. Way to go. If you want to. Oh, hang well. <laughs> hey, I don't need any awards. I'm, I'm happy to do this. This is, this is, you know, this is my job and I, I love doing it and you don't have to nominate me. I do it because it matters. So. <laughs> well, you have a good attitude about it. We appreciate it. You're welcome to hang with us, but if you don't, you, we know you got a lot of things to address. So you have a great day and uh, Jim will flip on to the next slide and let me introduce some other guests that we've got with us. All right, y'all, I really appreciate you letting me speak to you. Y'all take care. If you ever need anything from me, you know how to get a hold of me. Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you, sir. All right, take care. Bye, guys. Well, our, our governor says everybody's part of Team Kentucky, but we've got four special guests from Team Kentucky, a part of everybody, that we want to introduce to you today. And uh, we're going to start out with John Caldwell. Let's get, flip over here. John is the new chief people officer at Valvoline. And Whoops. some of you know him. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, I'm oh. Gonna back up a little it, bit there. It <laughs> went a little crazy. And, uh, <laughs> John, some of you know, because he was with Fifth Third Bank for a long time, but he's been with Valvoline quite a while now, and he's just uh, ascended to the throne of be the head of uh, HR, and he's got some things to share with us. And then we've got Michelle, a little follow-up, and I'll introduce Michelle. We'll come back to the slide in a minute, Jim. Let's go ahead. John, are you with us, and can you share some ideas with us? Yes, I've I'm asked, here, Lyle. Can okay, you hear I've me? Asked folks to tell us what's going on at their company. What are they facing? What are their big challenges? And, and what's working for them. So take it away, John. Sounds good. Can you hear me, Lyle? Just to make sure Absolutely. before I... Absolutely, loud and clear. Great, great. Well, what a time to step into this role <laughs> um, in the midst of global pandemic. And I know we're all uh, faced with a lot of challenges. And I'll run through uh, some of the challenges that we've been dealing with here at Valvoline. I know they're going to be all too familiar to most of you on the phone. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I would talk about is we've got... Um, a number of different work environments within Valvoline. Um, we've got corporate employees and those employees are, we're able to work from home uh, right now. Similarly, uh, our sales team, we've kind of put complete travel restrictions on them. Obviously, you know, several weeks ago, we um, 
restricted them from, from you know, mass transit. But even just a, a week and a half or so ago, we asked them, hey, even if you're visiting a customer that's five miles down the road, we don't want you to do that right now. We want you to stay at home. Um, so those are our big changes that we've been making. I think one thing that has really enabled us to do that is the technology. We've got the Microsoft Office suite, so we've been using Teams instead of Zoom for meetings like this. Uh, Yammer has been a great tool um, for employees to just remain connected with one another so that uh, everything doesn't have to come from a corporate perspective or corporate communications, uh, but a nice way for folks to remain connected, get some of that social engagement that you miss uh, by not being in the office. And I think that, you know, the, the one silver lining to this uh, that I've seen is for the contingent of employees who are able to work from home is it's worked pretty well. And we're actually pretty good at this. And so I think it could open up doors uh, to us being more open to remote workers uh, going forward, which sometimes here, our corporate office is based in Lexington. It can be a challenge to get um, people even from Louisville, Cincinnati, Nashville, uh, to relocate to Lexington. So I think this could um, have a positive impact in that way. Um, asking our sales team to use technology to connect in other ways to continue to support and service their customers and clients. Um, and one thing that's been interesting, we've, we've got um, a customer support center is another type of work environment that we have here. And they've been growing over the last couple of years. They don't only answer the phones for our Valvoline Instant Oil Change retail shops, but it's a service that we can provide to some of our installer channel customers. So tire stores, dealerships, they will say, we can answer the phone for you. Um, and they've actually seen productivity increase uh, over the last few, over the last month or so since they've been working at home, um, which has been fantastic. You know, the, um, to that end, a lot of, uh, obviously, you know, it, it's been interesting because you've got certain work environments or certain employees that are crazy busy right now. You know, our HR business partners, our corporate communications teams, just thinking of HR specifically. Um, but then, you know, you've got other groups like maybe a talent acquisition team uh, that's not quite as busy. So for those individuals, we're, we've got this kind of hashtag prepare to win. It's really just been kind of a, a communication strategy where starting at the top with our CEO, trying to keep us focused on getting through this what will look like when we get to the other side of this crisis and really being focused on the future, taking time to invest so we, we can be prepared to win in yourself in projects that maybe you haven't been able to get to uh, through the pace of, of busy days usually. Um, Salesforce cleanup if you're using that uh, out in the field as well. You know, a, a lot of the work, obviously we've got a, a number of essential employees uh, who can't work from home. And that's where a lot of our work and heavy lifting has come. We've got uh, our Valvoline Instant Oil Change, so the retail side of our business. Uh, across the U.S., we've got about 550 company-owned stores, plus about 700 franchise stores. And, you know, just a number of safety precautions that we've been taking there. You know, we have been, continued to be deemed an essential business, um, and even a life-sustaining business. The states have, have gone to use that, that terminology. Uh, given the auto repair and auto maintenance aspect of our business. And you know, fortunately, I think maybe more so than some other retailers, um, our, our model is built for this. You stay in your car when you have your oil changed. And even just with some slight modifications, um, even really making that, a, a, a you know, avoiding any, any you know, uh, personal interaction with, with our, our team members. You're uh, able to stay in car, no contact. You know, uh, we don't do in-cabin filter changes. Instead of handing, you know, locking your keys into a box for safety purposes, we're asking folks to put them on the dash. You can pay with Google Pay, Apple Pay. So um, that has helped um, our essential employees. You know, also, um, obviously, our car count. So just the volume is way down. So our, the, the employees that we need in the service centers are way down, which helps with social distancing, certainly, as well. <laughs> Um, we've got labs uh, in, a, in a few different spots throughout the U.S. and actually across the globe. Um, one thing we've been doing there is those employees, they have to, they do have to be in the lab for some of the testing that they do, but there's also a fair amount of, of office work that they do. So we've been able to do alternating schedules there and cleaning, sanitizing the workspaces in between. Um, and then we've got plants and distribution centers as well that um, 
we've been able to, to either stagger uh, work um, schedules. Um, they're a little more of an advantageous environment than say our stores because they're pretty expansive um, distribution centers and plants. So social distancing has, has certainly been uh, very feasible and possible there. Plus you don't have the customer interaction that you've got in our instant oil change environment. Um, we have also just um, starting this week, um, are starting to provide premium pay for our retail employees on the instant oil change side, um, at least through May, and we'll continue to reevaluate that uh, moving forward. But giving our hourly employees um, a couple extra dollars um, for, um, for continuing to, to, to uh, you know, jump in and, and work uh, in our service centers and support our customers. Um, one thing I'll comment on that too is um, the way we've handled, um, you know, kind of, we have strongly encouraged anyone who's a high risk employee to stay at home, uh, even our, from an essential employee perspective. And um, we've had those employees um, either sign uh, certifications around that or, or waivers, if you will. So it, it's in essence, uh, the employees that are continuing to work in our service centers are you know, they're, I'm not going to say volunteering to do that because certainly we're paying those employees, but we are giving them the option. And in fact, if they fall within that high risk, they're caring for someone or live with someone who's high risk, we're asking them to stay at home through this time. Um, we've been able to provide additional um, sick pay uh, balances for those employees uh, during this time to enable them to do that. And then certainly the, uh, the unemployment benefits and the, the sweetener from the CARES Act. Uh, is helping that as well and and have been able to that's actually worked well for us um, you know given the the reduced volume that we've got in our stores um, just those two bullets around communications you know really um, from a crisis communication plan we've got kind of a break the glass um, communication plan that's ready um, when and if we have an individual in um, one of our service centers or one of our offices uh, any plants who is affected um, that includes, you know, social media response. Um, we've got communications that we would send to our customers. Uh, anyone who's been in the store uh, within, you know, a certain period of time and just notifying them that we do have an employee or we did have an employee that tested positive. We have been knock on wood, um, given that we've got 8,000 employees um, around the globe, uh, the number of cases that we've had has been incredibly low. Um, so we feel very blessed and, and fortunate in, in that way. Um, also just, you know, quarantine practices, sanitation practices, all of those uh, things we've got in, in play. And then the last thing, last couple things I'll cover um, briefly, just time away and pay balances. Um, we really have a, kind of a scenario chart that, you know, we've got about 10 to 11 different scenarios that, you know, and, and how management uh, and HR responds. If someone is high risk, then, you know, this is what we're recommending that we do from a time away, you know, pay uh, time away balance and, and pay perspective. Um, and that does vary given our different work environments, again, from plant to, to store to office. Um, but we were able to, to kind of quickly pull those together and are kind of, and are monitoring um, our response there, tracking our response in those scenarios. And then the, the, the next big hurdle for us that we've, we're tackling right now is just um, what to do with our incentive plans, whether they be our annual incentive plans for corporate employees, uh, executives certainly, but then also even our sales incentive plans. Um, you know, we were having a really good uh, first five, five and a half months of the year, um, and then this happened. So, uh, you know, what do we do? Um, certainly there's been a, a dramatic uh, impact to our shareholders. Uh, there's impact to our employees, so how do we factor that in and make the right decisions on what we do from a from a pay plan, incentive plan perspective? So that's a lot. Um, I'll I'll uh, I'll pause there. <laughs> so I wanted to. I'm, this is Jim Morris. I wanted to ask you a question. I'm going to drag this down here and ask if you did anything like this. We talked about this in week one. Um, you said a uh, uh, break the glass. Do you have, was this the type of thing that you ended up like a flow chart with all of the, I don't know if you can see that or not. Yeah, I can, Jim. Let me see. It, it, not in, as I do a, 
um, quick cursory view of it here. It does look like it. Yeah, we, we had a steering yeah. committee, a bit of a SWAT team, um, that got maybe a running start on this because we have operations in China. Right. And so in, you know, probably early January, mid-January, we had a steering committee together and, and started to do some of these things. So uh, if an employee, you know, is, is diagnosed, then what do you do? You know, you right, send that right. employee home for 14 days, you send all the employees home for 14 days, you come in and sanitize the, the work environment, um, those sorts of things. Just thought it was interesting when you said that because that's, uh, I, that's the group that I was in with a different customer and, and the break the glass strategy was, you know, you've got to have something ahead of time ready to go for any of it because this is such a big media relations, government relations, uh, employee situation, how to handle things from A to Z. Uh, we haven't covered that now, Lyle, in a month, believe it or not, but uh, we did in the first seminar uh, go through that whole strategy and, you know, I'd encourage people to go back, take a look at the slides. There was a lot of information in there, but it's real uh, and I can't believe Kudos to you all. I can't believe you haven't had a COVID-19 explosion yet with the amount of um, employees you have worldwide that you haven't had that to break that glass yet. But it's it's that critical to have in place. So I just thought I'd share that. Good, Good yeah. work, Ron. And Jim, thanks for bringing that up uh, to our attention. Uh, this is really helpful. And uh, we'll see if we get some questions as we go, but why don't we move on to Michelle? You want to jump back up to that wonderful photo of Michelle for just a minute? Uh, hey, Michelle, we're glad you're here. Hey. Michelle Stevens is the General Affairs and Human Resource Manager for Sekasui America up uh, in, in Winchester, Kentucky. And uh, that's, of course, a global company. You can expect they've got a lot in Japan, but they also have things around the world and in uh, South America and, and in the United States. And uh, she's been in H HR for 30 years. I bet you... Michelle, when you got that degree in human services management some years ago, um, you didn't know you'd be applying it so much right now. Well, you know, she thought she was going to retire in July, but we're not so sure that's going to happen. At this point. So we're yeah. glad you're here. Tell us about what's going on at Sakasui. Okay. Well, like a lot of the companies, um, we started out with communication from some of our global companies. So we had a little bit of notice that it was, it was headed our way. Um, we have been doing a lot of communication and we initially started with the social distancing. Um, we have a glass hallway that connects our office area with our production area. Um, and it's become a very useful tool for us. And the glass windows down both sides are covered with information about COVID-19, about unemployment, about our, our benefits. Um, Unfortunately, with all of the auto layer, auto manufacturers laying off, our, our um, production quickly dwindled and we have had people um, off work now for going on four weeks. Um, we've been very fortunate because we've been able to pay uh, not only our, our regular associates, but our nine temporaries full pay so far. Um, as of last Friday, that uh, return to work date has been pushed out and so now obviously we are looking at different financial arrangements so this call has been really helpful to hear some of the things that are going on especially the work share. A couple of things that we did um, as everybody we had a, a shortage of supplies and um, HR people tend to be good pack rats and so I would say if you um, are in HR take a look in your supply cabinets one of the things we found tucked away in the back of one of our shelves was a case of hand sanitizer, the little boxes that fit in the machines that go on the wall that we had replaced with new machines. And so we went out and purchased travel bottles and we funneled hand sanitizer into those travel bottles and part of our PPE that's required became that bottle of hand sanitizer in your pocket at all times and being used as necessary. Um, that, that proved to, to kind of be a kickoff for us with our associates as we communicated with them. I think we, we faced the same things that everybody's faced. What do we do? Do we lay off? Do we cut hours? 
Um, do we try to maintain payroll? How do we social distance? And I think all of us are dealing with those, but our bigger, I won't say bigger, but one of our big concerns was how are we gonna keep our people? Um, we were in a situation where the unemployment was so low to start with, getting people and maintaining people, and it takes us about a full year to train somebody fully for our process, we need those people. We can't afford to lose any of them. And so once we sent them out of here, even though they're getting their full pay, we're getting a lot of questions about, well, why aren't you laying us off? Because we could get that $600 and some of them would make more money. So we've had to find kind of a creative way to keep our people engaged. And I think that's probably one of the things we're most proud of um, throughout this whole process. We send a couple of emails a day out, one dealing with the status of production. What's going on with customers? What's going on with the big players in the game? Um, what are we doing? What's the management doing? What are we doing on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that their jobs will still be here? And then we send, send out one fun type email each day. When I say fun, it's usually an activity that they're supposed to do with their families, or it's information on a benefit that could help their families. We're sending out packets, um, kids packets, SSA kids packets every week um, to every child of our associate. Those packets have family activities, children's activities, coloring pages, um, information about the virus. We did a comic book on COVID-19 for the kids to explain what it is and, and why they're out of school and that type of thing. What that's allowed us to do, because we hit the kids, they now have projects that if they submit them back to the company, they're entered for drawings. Now, they're not big big drawings of any kind. They're a $5 coupon to McDonald's or they may be a little toy or uh, a coloring book and crayons. But that engages our associates so that when those kids get those packets and tear them open, they know there's something they have to have mom or dad help them with because it's got to come back here. Um, Last week, we had to cancel the Easter egg hunt, which is a huge event for our kids and for, for the parents. So we did social distancing by the, doing a drive-through Easter basket. Uh, we had the Easter bunny here in a rocking chair and six feet in front of the rabbit. We had tape marks and the associates drove up with their kids, stayed in the car until their net baskets were on the tape marks. Then they were escorted to their tape mark by their parents. We took a picture, they got in the car and away they went. Um, so we were able to keep that connection with the associates. And I think that's been our biggest fear is not being able to keep connected. Um, we're getting emails from, I would say, roughly eight to 10 associates a day um, saying, hey, my kid got the packet today. Thanks a lot. Or, hey, they're done with their scavenger hunt. I can't bring it in. Should I just take a picture of it? Down those glass hallways are all these projects. So when they come back, their kids' projects line that hallway. Um, it doesn't sound like a lot. It doesn't cost us much. Um, it's a heck of a drain on HR time. Um, but in the long run, we're not going to have to replace people that are trained for our jobs. I think those are the things that, that maybe we're doing that are a little bit different, um, along with all the social distancing and the education piece of it. Wow, Michelle, I think you told me it takes a year to get somebody up to speed in your plant. So uh, hanging on to them is really valuable. That's pretty cool. That's great. Um, any questions for uh, Michelle as we went along here? Allison or Chase? All right. Well, I think you can go down to the chat thing and do claps. And so that's what I'd be doing right now is doing claps for you, Michelle. Way to go. Thank you for sharing that. We really appreciate it. Hey, next we're going to hear from Joe Bon Jovi. And uh, now Joe is the Chief Human Resource Officer at Sazerac. And for those you don't know, Sazerac is the parent of Buffalo Trace, which produces all kinds of fine uh, uh, juices for your entertainment after work. I, I asked him if he could just bring some samples, but we weren't sure how to get them around to everybody. So, <laughs> but uh, he's had a super career um, uh, and has worked with uh, Michael Baker International and Cardinal Health and Citicorp and Pepsi and GE. So like some of the other super professionals I know, just can't hold on to a job, it sounds like. But 
Uh, he's done a great job with us, and we love working with him. And uh, he's based over in Louisville. They have plants, of course. You you know Buffalo Pl uh, Chase uh, or Buffalo Trace uh, plant in um, uh, Frankfurt, but they also have several things in Louisville and other places across the state, including Owensboro and others. So, boy, Joe, we're glad you're here. Tell us what's going on at Sazerac. Thanks a lot, Alan. I, I appreciate it. Can everyone hear me okay? Loud and clear. Got it. Good. Thanks. So a uh, couple, couple of things just at a high level, as Lyle uh, mentioned, um, you know, we've got a number of different facilities. We're uh, also a global uh, company, although our weighted average tends towards the United States and uh, North America in general, where we have 12 uh, production facilities, all of which are up and running uh, right now. We've been declared to be an essential uh, business as far, part of the uh, food and agriculture supply chain, uh, so important for us to be doing uh, what we're doing across uh, North America. Within that footprint, our heavily weighted average is towards uh, Kentuckyana. Uh, we have three big plants in Kentucky and one in southern uh, Indiana, and uh, we are very focused right now on uh, continuing to meet the obligations that we have, the service needs of our customers. Um, as you can imagine, uh, demand continues to be uh, very high, even though on-premise has um, shrunk to uh, trickle. Uh, we have a very large off-premise business in the retail uh, space. That's requiring us, um, John was mentioning earlier, the different kinds of uh, team members that he has. We're very similar. Uh, we have headquarters and support staff. We try to send as many of those individuals as we can home. We do have a small crisis uh, uh, management team that continues to come to the office uh, to try to coordinate things across the company. Uh, we have a commercial team that's essentially split between sales and marketing. We try to get the marketing folks home. They're working on strategic priorities, but our sales folks, more than 100 people, are out in the marketplace. Our retailers are very much in need of support right now, and we're trying to back them up in every way uh, we can. Uh, the vast majority of our population is in the manufacturing facilities uh, and we continue um, to uh, produce in those locations. We have strenuously followed all the CDC guidelines around health and safety in those locations. Um, we're taking proactive steps. Social distancing is absolutely key. Uh, we do a lot of training for folks. We've done COVID uh, 19 positive drills, which uh, if you're open for business and, and you're not doing that, I highly recommend it. We learned a tremendous amount. We will randomly pick a person or some people in different locations to be, quote unquote, come down with COVID-19, get a positive test result, uh, and then we ask the local teams to spring into action. From there, it's just been tremendously helpful in terms of making sure that they have everything in place to keep people uh, healthy uh, and safe. Uh, in addition to that, we've uh, been focused on uh, acquiring PPE. We haven't mandated it yet. It's still optional uh, for our folks, but uh, we've ordered large amounts of uh, surgical masks that we're able to deploy into the workplace um, soon. Uh, we had ordered a large amount of N95 masks, which we uh, determined was counterproductive, and we've taken those and we have now donated those uh, to hospitals and other facilities uh, where they're better used than in our particular uh, locations. We're very highly focused on communications. Uh, we work Q&A. We have a daily 4 p.m. conference call for the leaders. Uh, of the firm. We've maintained open uh, channels to all of our team members. Uh, for those of you who know Mark Brown, who's our CEO, he's been doing uh, every couple of days an email out to all of our team members, taking feedback and questions from them uh, and engaged in a two-way uh, dialogue. So nothing's more important to us right now uh, than our communication and interaction with uh, our team members. I just say the um, we've also done premium pay uh, for anybody who's required to come into the workplace. Uh, we're doing about $125 uh, a week premium pay to our frontline uh, team members. We call it customer and community pay. We don't call it hazard pay because we're doing everything in our power to make sure it's not hazardous uh, to come in the workplace. But we do want to recognize the work that people have done 
to go above and beyond the call of duty at a time uh, like this. So we're recognizing them with some additional customer and community premium uh, pay. Uh, and then I guess the last thing I'll mention is that our business continues to be uh, robust, both in the short term uh, and also we think in the long term. And we don't take that for granted in any way uh, whatsoever. We understand at a time when millions, tens of millions of people are losing their jobs, we're very fortunate to be able to continue to protect the livelihood of the people who work at Sazerac. Uh, and, and towards that end, we also have uh, enough uh, people, enough opportunities here that we can provide good employment to quality people who may have lost their jobs at a time like this. So uh, I'll stop uh, right there, a lot going on. Um, it's been a time for leaders uh, to step up within our firm at all levels. Um, it's been an exciting time, even though it's been quite demanding. Now that was great, Joe. Thanks for get some good input there. Um, any questions coming in that people wanna ask? Uh, I did see one while you were talking about masks, which um, I think you kind of covered, but you're, I, I get the, the N95. I had some of those and gave them to EMTs locally. Mm -hmm. yep. And uh, I think it's a good thing that you share those. But so what kind of masks, you're encouraging people to, to wear them? Yeah, regular, the regular uh, light blue surgical masks that you're used to seeing. We, we were able to get a fairly large order of those uh, to make sure we could cover all of our team members in all of our locations. Okay, all right. Yeah, and Lyle, we've got a part of our update is from the OSHA on that on the legal side, so we'll be covering a little bit of that a, uh, a few slides down as well. Okay, good. And we did have a question. I've been trying to answer some of them. Uh, he had a really good uh, qualifier for hazard pay, calling it customer and community premium pay. Uh, so we've answered that as we're going, explaining what he was calling that, so. I think that's a great idea. Joe, thank you very much. If, other, you. if you're gonna hang with us, that's great. And we may have some other questions as we move towards the end. Great, All right, that and cleanup. Ladies and gentlemen, John Petrov uh, from, uh, he's the CHRO at CHI Catholic Health Initiatives. And that's St. Joe if you're in Central Kentucky, but. John can tell you they are, they have eight facilities across the state and, uh, and he's got 6,000 employees. So he's got quite an operation and a big variety. And I think you'll be surprised if he shares with us kind of what's going on at the hospitals because it's not exactly what you might expect. At least that's what I found. So John, we are so glad you're here and join us and take it away. Thank you. Good morning, Lyle. Can you all hear me okay? Loud and clear. Excellent. So I wanted to talk to you all and give you an update on how COVID-19 has impacted healthcare operations here across the Commonwealth. I do stay in close contact with the head of HR for Baptist Healthcare, UK Healthcare, LifePoint, and some of our other competitors. Um, our CEOs are working together as well to collaborate and ensure that we have the best possible response to the community in this time of crisis. From an HR perspective though, uh, we have not seen a huge surge thus far in COVID-19 cases in the Lexington community, Louisville, or across the state. And I think some of that may very well be attributed to the preemptive measures that Governor Bashir and his administration has taken with regard to social distancing and all the impacts to business closures and things of that nature across the state. Um, we're fortunate in that regard. We're not like New York City and some other places such as Michigan and New Orleans, which has seen a huge um, increase in COVID-19 cases. However, on the flip side, given the governor's mandate uh, to minimize um, contact with others, in healthcare a couple weeks back, there was an order for us to um, stop elective procedures. Think of it as like a a colonoscopy, an endoscopy, uh, a variety of other types of medical procedures that uh, address uh, a myriad of issues that you may have from a health perspective. Uh, in addition, um, office visits at our physician uh, offices throughout the state have declined. And I'm gonna just give you some stats as of early April. Our acute admissions across the hospital system here in Kentucky are down about 40%. So on average, um, we're le we have less than 40% of our patients coming to see us that they normally would. 
outpatient surgeries are down about 80%. Um, we are still able to do outpatient sur surgeries, but they're for critical type scenarios, which are one-offs. Uh, inpatient surgeries are down about half. Our ER visits across the state are down about half. And our outpatient visits are down a little over half of what we're accustomed to. And when you think about 6,000 workers and about half your population not working, um, that's a big task or a fundamental task for us to take on as an employer because in healthcare, um, we don't make a lot of money. And uh, for one, CHI St. Joseph Health is a not-for-profit health system. So the little money that we do make, we reinvest back into our facilities, our people, our technology, our patients, so on and so forth. So as a result of this, we have had to implement uh, furloughs. In fact, this past Thursday was the, the first time that we announced that we were going through a process of furloughing uh, both exempt and non-exempt staff. And as um, mentioned earlier uh, from Muncie with uh, respect to the state, you know, navigating a, a non-exempt employee is fairly straightforward, um, but navigating how unemployment and other things would impact an exempt employee is a little bit more challenging. So in our world, um, we put in some measures to help mitigate the impact that furloughing exempt staff would have on them. And we have proceeded with about 300 of our, what we would call our system or corporate employees and employees from fixed departments that support areas of our operations, such as finance and marketing, have been notified that they will have to take two weeks of furlough over the next four weeks. And that's half of a department would go on furlough for two weeks and the other half would work and then the furlough staff would come back work for two weeks and the other half would take furlough. During the period of furlough, we do allow employees to um, take uh, or use their paid time off. In some scenarios though, it would be more advantageous for the individual to go on unemployment and receive the $600 additional subsidy from the federal government. Uh, we are also covering benefits any employee that sees a reduction of their pay of less than 90% within a biweekly pay period, uh, Common Spirit Health, which is our parent entity, has made the business decision, which we're very appreciative of, uh, to cover the full medical, dental, short-term, and long-term disability premiums for that respective pay period for the employee and any dependents that they cover. Um, in addition, uh, we, are, we stood up a, um, a float pool, if you will, uh, through our command center, where we are looking to redeploy our employees wherever possible to other facilities. Again, we have not seen a significant number of COVID-19 patients. We do have them, um, but certainly it's, it's not um, anything that is significant at this time. So there isn't a whole lot of other work to go around, and that's the reason why we move forward to furlough. We are anticipating along with the state that Kentucky will see a surge within the next couple weeks. And for those individuals who are furloughed and especially those who are exempt, they are on standby to return to work with short notice, notice if we see a surge. Uh, and to be compliant with Fair Labor Standards Act, if, if we recall an employee during a week in which they were furloughed, we would have to pay them their full wages for that week. And it's very important if an exempt employee is placed on furlough, it needs to be for an entire work week. The IRS plus the federal government, Department of Labor, constitutes a full work week um, from 12.01 midnight on, on a Sunday through 11.59 p.m. on Saturday. So it's a Sunday through Saturday work week. And they cannot do any work whatsoever during that week. If they answer an email as an exempt employee, that could constitute work for that week and they should receive full pay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. We've partnered with our communications department, our leadership team, and ensuring that the communications regarding the furloughs, which were presented uh, this past Thursday in writing, there was a letter to each individual employee, individual conversations took place. We have a resource guide available to them, walking them through the unemployment process as well as other benefits that may be available to them. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that our managers who were delivering these messages are doing so with empathy and compassion. Compassion is one of our four core values here at um, CHI St. Joseph Health, irreverence, integrity, compassion, and excellence. So we wanna demonstrate that in these conversations. And really managing through what we believe to be a very difficult time within our industry and our business, 
Um, we stand ready to care for our patients. We have not instituted hazard pay, similar to what Joe uh, had said. Um, in essence, as long as our employees are following appropriate safety protocols and measures as outlined by the CDC and using personal protective equipment, um, they're not necessarily in a hazardous situation. And I have to knock on wood because while we've had many exposures, and let me back up, if an employee had a work-related exposure uh, that was identified as a high risk, we placed them on paid administrative leave for a 14-day period for quarantine, and we tested them twice to ensure that they were negative for COVID-19 before we would return them to work. But take a step back, I'm, and I knock on wood again, um, we have not had any of our frontline caregivers test positive for COVID-19 thus far, even those that were exposed uh, initially um, when we first saw our initial cases here in Kentucky. And, and I applaud our healthcare heroes on the front line for doing all that they can to take care of all our patients, regardless of their health status or condition, in an empathetic and professional, safe and high quality way. Um, and I think that's it at a high level, what we have going on here, Lyle. I don't know if you or any others have, have questions. I'll, I'll be happy to answer them. Great, thank you, John. Wow, it's, that's a, a, a great perspective for us. Hey, I heard on the news that uh, Kroger is gonna start providing drive-through testing. Do you know about that? And is that, uh, when, when might that be a reality? And you know, what, what can you say about the in, enhancing or increasing testing? You know, I can't speak to the Kroger situation, Law. That's news to me, to be honest with you. But we are partnering with uh, Stephen Stack, Dr. Stack, and um, the, our state government, right? He, he's over health and human services and, and what have you. And um, we're working with the powers that be at the state level to establish some testing facilities throughout the state. Uh, in the CHI St. Joseph Health Family, Bardstown, or Flagey Memorial Hospital, will be one of those locations. I believe here in Lexington, it will be a partnership through UK. So I'm not sure about the Kroger thing, but I do know that some testing sites are going to be ramping up here soon. The difficulty is the number of tests that remain available are quite limited here in Kentucky and throughout the nation. And the same thing holds true with PPE, N95 masks and otherwise. You know, there are limited quantities of those supplies, so we have to be very prudent and careful when we exercise use of these things. Um, that's, that's in general what I, what I would have to say at this point in time. Wow, okay. Um, I think it's critical to getting this thing under control. Any other questions come in? How about our team out there? Um, Allison and Chase, Autumn? So we've got one question, but I think it's really more of an opinion question, which is just, is there, do you ever see a time in Kentucky that all citizens are tested? No, that's a great question. And I think that that should enough tests be made available. I think that would be a prudent thing to do. And that's my personal opinion, not that of my health system that I, I work for. Um, but the question remains whether or not we will have enough tests. And, you know, I, I think ideally, the direction that we're heading in is to either find a vaccine or find a, a true, um, whether it's a medication therapy or some other treatment. You know, we talk about ventilators and we talk about a number of different um, measures or means with which we can treat the virus. They're all questionable at this point in time. There, there's no hard science behind do X and you will turn out with Y or Z. Um, everything is, is in somewhat of a, a test mode, if you will. Um, there's, there's really no proven therapy or treatment thus far that's been identified for COVID-19. It's, um, it's a pesky virus and bugger that's out there. Uh, and, and one of the other things that we find is it changes its course very quickly. As we know, you know, the most vulnerable of our population are elderly folks, folks over 65, folks who are immunocompromised, maybe diabetic, um, may um, uh, have uh, obesity uh, as an issue. Um, but COVID-19, just like, can kill a young, healthy person with no other known issues. So, you know, distancing is an important thing that we, we do believe helps to divert the spread of the disease and certainly it increasing at an exponential rate relatively quickly. So um, we've gotten hit hardest, I think, in the world. We have the, the long tier of the cases now globally. 
And, um, I, you know, the United States is a very complicated um, system, if you will, when you think about state rights and federal rights and the different governing bodies and what have you. So we're doing the best that we can do. And, and you know, regardless of one's political views, I will say that um, our governor has been very um, steadfast, transparent, communicative, and um, I have nothing but utmost respect for the way in which Kentucky has responded to this pandemic. Thank you, John. That was really helpful. Hey, we've got another um, guest speaker on tap here, Jim. <laughs> Jim's going to give us an update on several things, particularly sick leave, uh, benefits, furloughs, and layoffs, particularly as they apply to international employees, if you happen to have some, and OSHA. So Jim, why don't you jump in and take care of some of those issues, and uh, let's don't hesitate to get our questions ready for Jim. Take it away, Jim. All right, so the fourth installment. Uh, I hope you all are happy with the shuffling around. We're trying to do things a little differently each week so that we can cover uh, as many different types of things for everybody in the state as possible. This is going to be a quick hit. Uh, hopefully you all get the information out of this that you need. There are a few things in here that have been touched on today, so we'll roll through them as they go, um, and we'll go from there. So sick leave under the uh, FFCRA, what is unable to work due to an isolation order. So this has been uh, tweaked, retweaked, regula regulation tweaked over and over again, and we covered some of this this morning. So I'm not going to waste a whole lot of time on here, but a uh, couple of things. In the past, we've talked about the quarantine, shelter in place, healthy at home, stay at home. Our governors put that in place. It does apply. However, they've come out with some regulations to help this because, as I stated in week one and week two, it was never the intent of the, the uh, legislators to make this a nationwide sick leave and emergency FMLEA leave. So they came back with the, the two things at the bottom here that I wanted to cover. Um, first, the regulations make clear that an employee subject to a quarantine may not take sick leave where the employer does not have work as a result of an order. So originally, the way the, the, way the statute read, you had to pay them. Uh, if they were uh, sheltering in place as a result of a quarantine, uh, everybody had to pay the two weeks and then the two-thirds of salary for the ten remaining weeks for those that had a child at home. This was a huge change. It's about ten days old now. We covered it last week and the week before, but just want to make sure you understand. And also, now that they've done this, uh, the broad definition of quarantine and isolation orders, if you have a telework, or you can't work, there's now only a very small subset of employees subject to quarantine who are actually going to be able to be entitled to sick paid or paid sick leave. And that's because of the change. If you don't have work available, they're not eligible for sick leave. If you're allowing them to work from home, they're not eligible for sick leave. And then you heard today, and I was really excited to hear it from an official. I had been saying it all along in these meetings that it would come out that way, but I loved hearing from uh, Muncie today that there's a, uh, a full-on attempt to stop people from saying, well, I couldn't go to work because I was afraid to go to work, or I, I just didn't want to work because I wanted to get paid. They've changed that. So those, these two things down here help with sick leave. And then, of course, the state law helps with regard to stopping people from just staying home when you have work available. So there's some other things, uh, and I loved hearing from both Valvoline, well, actually, Cesarec, uh, Valvoline, and, uh, well, all of them. Uh, the, these are critical things, but I heard someone talking about their benefit coordinator and uh, making sure that things are there. I've dealt with a couple of companies that, in my opinion, jumped the gun in laying people off before the law changed, and also I kept reminding them, hey, have you checked what, it, what the benefits are and how to handle this before you just jump in and terminate people or jump in and reduce hours? So I've been pushing for a lot of people to be 
very careful with their HR, uh, and this is where you know Allison and Lyle and Autumn and and Chase all come into play, and all of the HR specialists that we have. In, before you reduce hours, before you lay off, before you terminate people, you need to do a benefits analysis. You need to sit down with your brain trust of HR people and make sure you come up with a plan. Now the big thing here, and a lot of people don't realize this, benefit plan documents control. They're all contracts. Everybody thinks that, you know, uh, they just look to the ERISA laws and everything's in ERISA. ERISA is there just to uh, enforce the contracts. Every decision that you make is a contract with your health care people, with your retirement, with your disability, whatever carrier you have, it's a contract that you have with them. And it, it's amazing to me the number of employees that don't understand that and the number of employers that don't understand that. Decisions are based on the contract you have with your insurance carrier, whether it's disability, health care, uh, long term, short term, everything you have, retirement, life, everything. It's a contract. You need to be looking at your contract. It's critical for you to know right now that uh, employees who are eligible for benefits, those are the employees that had 30 weeks or less, I'm sorry, 30 weeks or more, 30 hours or more per week, sorry. Uh, and that are active on FMLA or EFMLEA, the brand new March 18th order that, or law that uh, President Trump put into play. If you uh, cover employees, this is critical for you to know, if you cover employees, even if it's out of the goodness of your heart, and you have not verified that that is okay to do with your carrier, you are in breach of your fiduciary duty under a contract with your carrier. You must pull out those old documents. I've got a contract here I just read. I was going to pull it out and hold it up, but I better not. You better pull out the contract you have for health insurance, for life insurance, for disability, and make sure that the decisions you're making, whether it's in favor of or against your employees, are capable of being made. You cannot pay benefits unless your contract says you can. If you lay people off for two weeks, furlough, whatever, you can't just voluntarily say, we'll, we'll just keep you on, uh, we won't issue this to COBRA, we'll, we'll keep you on uh, health while you're off. You can't do that unless your contract says that. And I can't remember whether it was Cesarec or whether it was uh, uh, John, one of the Johns, because there was a comment made of the carrier was gracious enough to agree to allow us to continue these people on benefits. I was thrilled to hear that because that means somebody is calling them to say, hey, we got to roll people on furlough for two weeks at a time. Will you cover that? That's huge. You have to make sure you are complying with your contract. Next, make sure if you're going to, to lay people off on a severance that the severance includes or that you are in compliance with your severance agreement, whether it predated or postdated this, you must make sure that those are included in your termination documents because a lot of those allow continuation. Also, as we've talked about now for three weeks, I think, make sure that you issue the, pro the proper WARN Act, the proper COBRA benefits, the proper notifications. Make sure your plan documents are all pulled out and you've read all of those. One caveat that I've had to alert people to, and this, this sounds really scary, uh, and you need to make sure you're doing it right. If the employer says, hey, guess what? You know what? I can't believe we're having to lay you off. So here's what we're going to do out of the goodness of our hearts. We're going to cover you for two months of your COBRA benefits. Three months. One month. Whatever you do could tie your employee to a critical problem on their part. And that's right down here. If you subsidize, the employee then is required to continue benefits beyond the subsidizing once they opt for COBRA until there's open enrollment under the Affordable Care Act. That is a critical issue for employees because if they do this, they are stuck until open enrollment 
to obtain benefits for the remainder. So you think you're doing something good for them, then they can't get open enrollment because they don't have a qualifying event. Keep that in mind because that could really hamstring the employee for the next four months to get to the open enrollment time period. Just a, a little hint to keep in mind. All right, another thing that's come into play and it's a big thing that people didn't think about, Affordable Care Act. There's some calculations in Affordable Care Act that create problems. A lot of employers use what's called um, look back. You have two choices under the Affordable Care Act. Let me, I jumped forward. I'm not gonna waste a lot of time on the slide, but I wanna make sure you keep this in mind. If you're reducing hours or you're putting employees on a leave of absence, you have to follow all the requirements of the ACA to determine whether an employee is full-time for purposes of health care coverage. The ACA has two types. You can use the monthly measurement. Basically, you determine full-time on a monthly basis. Most employers I have consulted with and most employers that I work with as retained general counsel use the look back method. That's a problem here. If you're using look back, you choose a period of time, whether it's uh, three months, six months, a year, typically it's three months to a year. Uh, if the employee works for 30 hours or more per week on average during whatever that measurement period is, then that employee is a full-time employee for purposes of the ACA stability period. The ACA stability period is the same length of time as your measurement period that you have utilized to show the government how you come up with the Affordable Care Act full-time employee status. If you're using that, then you need to be aware. Reducing hours may not cause employees to lose health care coverage immediately. Sorry for the typo, that's me. <laughs> Changed that this morning. Um, you may be required to continue payment of employees under the Affordable Care Act for the whole term of the stability period. That's critical to keep in mind, something that's a brand new consideration that I'm seeing shaking out. I just want to make sure you're aware of it. All right. A lot of employees in this area, a lot of employers in this, in this area, we used to do a lot of uh, immigration uh, H-1B visas. Uh, we still do some for some of our uh, companies, but it's not, just so you know, I'm not the H-1B here. We've got another attorney here that handles that. So don't start asking me H-1B questions, but I do serve in general counsel capacity. I see these things happen. I want to make sure you all are aware. Furloughs, layoffs, and reduction in pay for H-1B employees is a crisis right now. If you have an H-1B employee, you need to be aware of what's going on, and this is critical on the screen right now. Question, does the law provide a path to unpaid furlough or temporary leave of H-1B workers? The answer is no. Currently, now we're hoping the regulations kept, catch up to this, but the CARES Act and the other provisions do not provide any protection for H-1B. So you've got a problem on your hand if you use H-1B and you furlough or involuntarily put them on unpaid leave, you could well be exposed to fines, back wages, and penalties. And they have to, what you have to do is you have to make sure that they are receiving at least the prevailing wage rate that was in your application approved by the government for H-1B workers. This is the crazy part, and this is what just drives me, uh, makes me very frustrated, but it's the reality. This is irrespective of the fact that you may not be paying similarly situated United States workers. Right now, the law has not caught up, and guess what? That means that your U.S. workers can indeed sue you for discrimination through the Department of Justice because you're not paying them the same wages as H-1B, but you can't furlough your H-1Bs like you are your full-time U.S. And that's because there is no law that allows you to furlough or involuntarily uh, lay them off. 
So what's the best way to minimize risk if an H-1B worker elects furlough? Sorry. Employees may only end your obligation to pay required wages in a non-productive status through termination, which includes notifying the USCIS and an offer to pay return transportation costs for the worker back to their homeland. That is the only method under the current law. I'm going to give you a little caveat here in just a minute. Here are the benefits and detriments of termination. If you terminate, the benefits are you eliminate the risk of future wage payment liability for the affected worker going back up to the fines, back wages, and penalties, and having to pay the wage rate. You lessen the risk you'll get a discrimination claim from U.S. workers. However, the detriments in this, I believe, may outweigh the benefits. And that is, you may not be able to return the H-1B worker promptly, especially if you wait more than the 60-day grace period. That is because the USCIS has suspended processing all claims until further notice, and if you're outside the grace period, it requires a full de novo review. That means reapplication, reproving your, your case that the person is a required employee that you don't have sufficient coverage in normal U.S. operations, et cetera, et cetera. It is not starting over where, or it is starting over, it's not starting with, hey, we, this person's already been here, we've already demonstrated it, can we just have them come back to work? So having an H-1B worker terminated creates a huge problem because chances are you won't get them back to work as you thought. All right, so, sorry. Given the current uncertainty, what should an employer do? I will tell you that this is, there is some risk to this, but this is what I'm recommending uh, to the people that I'm giving guidance to. I'm not giving you legal advice because I don't represent you unless you're one of the people on here that I do represent and you know who you are. Absent guidance from the DOL and the USCIS, uh, employers are left to demonstrate, quote unquote, substantial good faith under pre existing law. You either have to keep the H 1B employee at full pay or effect a termination. And this is the recommendation I'm giving. Uh, for those that are willing to take some level of risk, here is the statute you need to look at Code of Regulations, sorry. Whoops. 20 CFR 544.731 C7, little Roman numeral 2. That's 20 CFR 544.731 C7. It provides that wages need not be paid, and I'm quoting directly because of how critical this is. If an H-1B non-immigrant experiences a period of non-productive status, due to conditions unrelated to employment, the ellipses are mine, and that renders the non-immigrant unable to work, the brackets are mine as well, then the employer shall not be obligated to pay the required wage rate uh, during that period. Now, that statute talks about if they decide to go on vacation, if they decide to leave, or if they're sick, or if they're caring for a relative, or, and this is the critical part, they experience a period of non-productive status due to conditions unrelated to employment. It's my position, this is me personally, uh, that it is probably worth the risk to take the position with the federal government uh, that you have a non-productive status due to conditions unrelated to employment. The DOL may not accept that. The USCIS may not accept that. Um, if you argue that a stay-at-home order as well as economic impact of the government ordered shutdown, and that's how I would phrase it, has caused a period of non-productive status, you may be able to skate by on that. But you would be taking the risk and you would want a legal opinion that tells you that that's what they believe you could do, um, but you would ultimately be the one making the business judgment risk 
after legal guidance on that status. So that's the current status of H-1B. It covers some of you. Some of you don't have anything. You're looking at it going, I don't know what an H-1B is. All right, OSHA updated guidance on respiratory protection. This is some of the questions we've gotten about surgical masks. There was brand new guidance on Friday for both uh, healthcare and non-healthcare. I'm going to drag them down on the screen too, but I want to walk through what it is. April 7th, OSHA provided interim guidance memorandum, permits extended use and reuse of respiratory, I'm sorry, respirators in all industries, including those beyond current shelf life. Worker can continue using an N95 respirator, and this is a direct quote, as long as the respirator maintains its structural and functional integrity and the filter material is not physically damaged, soiled, or contaminated. If you do this as an employer, you're required to address in your policy for use of these respirators the circumstances under which a disposable respiratory will be considered contaminated and not available for extended use or reuse. Healthcare workers, you cannot perform surgical procedures or procedures expected to generate aerosols on patients infected with or potentially infected with COVID-19 using these 95 respirators, uh, I'm sorry, reusing an expired or um, ones that you've used before. It does not go as far as the CDC in allowing use of face masks as an acceptable alternative. So keep in mind you have two different standards. One is OSHA, one is CDC. CDC says please use something. OSHA says nope but you can reuse in certain circumstances. This, again, this is brand new, cutting just came out last week. Expired respirators can be used if you've made a good faith effort to acquire in-date respirators and you cannot acquire any. That's everyone basically right now. You must visually inspect all out of date and you cannot commingle with in-date respirators. You must keep them segregated and you must uh, continue to inspect. Employers still must comply with all other requirements of the respiratory protection standard, and you should reassess, and this is good for everyone to understand, outside of healthcare, we've heard of donations today from Cesarec and I believe from the others. You should reassess, and this is a direct quote, reassess your engineering controls, work practices, and administrative controls to decrease the need for N95 respirators, including to temporary, temporarily suspend certain non-essential operations. Again, that's in the brand new guidance. Also, uh, earlier in the week last week, actually the week before, Friday the 3rd, uh, OSHA came out with a allowed use of other countries' respirators I'm going to drag each of these down so you can see them, starting with the last one. So this is the uh, OSHA standard for um, other countries, dated the 3rd of, of April. There's a link on there for the other types throughout the countries, uh, which ones you can use, what the names are, um, and so on. I'm not going to read it, just letting you know where to find it. It's on the OSHA website. Oops, let me drag that down. Um, OSHA.gov memos, uh, April the 3rd. So that's one. The other one is uh, on the, the 7th, the interim guidance. Oh, there's a brand new one, sorry. Uh, this one came out on the 10th. I can't find the 7th because I replaced it with the 10th, so I'm sorry. This is also brand new. This is not part of my slide, but I wanted you to be aware this just came out. Um, if you have a COVID-19 that occurs at work, it is not a recordable illness unless you're in the healthcare industry. This just popped up for recording cases of COVID-19. This is on April 10th. For anybody who is, again, let me show this. Um, whoops. Healthcare. Emergency response, 
law enforcement and correctional institutions must continue to make work relatedness determinations pursuant to 29 CFR 1904. Everyone else, they have changed it. So they actually had early on, you had to continue your recordable illnesses, potential tracking, so on and so forth. On Friday, they came out and said, uh, we understand that it's almost impossible right now to keep track. So unless you have uh, a reason to believe it happened at work, you're not required to go through all of the onerous standards. So that's brand new OSHA. So I just want to throw that in there. That's also, that's not part of my slides, but it just happened. I thought it was critical to throw in there. Uh, that's it on mine, unless there are questions on any of the uh, employment guidance. I deleted about 37 slides. Just kidding. Um, no, I deleted some of the slides that I think we've covered in the past, and I want to encourage anybody, if you need to look at any of the other types of questions, legally we've covered them in the past. We've tried to make sure we're on task. Um, and go back to the other weeks because there's a lot of good information in there. Do keep in mind, same caveat I've given before, drinking from a fire hose, things change every day. You just saw there are three updates on Friday from OSHA alone. DOL had updates, uh, wage and hour division had updates. Kentucky, we just got one this morning on an update. Everything changes daily. You need to get guidance if you don't have it. Uh, find a way to get legal guidance on this. Um, and the information I'm giving today and any answers I give today, um, this it will be the uh, best information I have as of the date that I give the guidance. And that's it. Thanks, Lyle. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Allison, any questions? I do have one question. It ties a little bit more into your last presentation about the Paycheck Protection Loan, but it also has an unemployment component. So I'll ask it here and we'll see what your um, take is. So yes, under, the, under the Paycheck Protection Act, where employers are encouraged to keep their employees on payroll for eight weeks, um, does it affect your eligibility for loans if an employee files for partial unemployment due to um, hours being reduced? So the answer is no, but it does affect you. So uh, the payroll protection, uh, sorry, paycheck protection plan is a loan available. It was covered last week. I'm gonna give a little synopsis to give it some flavor. Uh, people that have 500 employees or less or an equivalent based upon a chart that is now available on the DO, uh, I think it's on the DOL website. Uh, no, it's on the SBA website. They've got a, an employer equivalent size above 500. Um, you can obtain a loan and you can write off that loan. Now, the way that works is you have to re-employ those people or s replace those people that you have laid off, or there will be a numerator and denominator calculation based upon the amount of people that you have employed. The way it works is for the eight weeks after you get your paycheck protection plan, if you have qualify, if you qualify for that loan, you have the ability to then you have the ability to then obtain a complete write-off of that loan for eight weeks, and it's for payroll, it's for your rent, it's for mortgages on real property or personal property. It's not for relocation expenses. It's not to pay off uh, uh, principal on a loan or anything else. It's only for interest payments on a loan for the eight weeks. So in your hypothetical question, if you've laid people off, if you bring them back, you will be full credit 100%. If you don't bring people back, then there's a numerator, numerator and denominator and you will get seven eighths, uh, three quarters, one half based upon the number of people you hire back, but it's for the eight weeks after you get the loan. Laying people off now does not impact the ability to obtain the PPP loan or the emergency injury disaster um, assistance through either the grant or the loan. Remember last week we talked about the $10,000 grant and the loan that's available uh, under the EIDL, EIDG, 
um, but you do have the ability to get the PPP. Once you get it, I would highly recommend you hire back as many people as you had before so that you can use the calculation and get the full eight weeks. Last week, we also had people asking about, well, what do I do after the eight weeks? Do I lay them back off? Do I do other things? Obviously, that's a case-by-case -case basis, um, and there's some legal guidance that you have to be very careful in there, as well as accounting guidance. So I would recommend getting some assistance in going through once you get the PPP loan. Only other thing I did want to qualify, I had a slide on all of this, and I deleted it. That was the one slide I deleted was interplay on PPP and the emergency injury. Um, the $10,000 loan, they said, was going to be within three days, uh, emergency grant, not loan. And they were talking about across the board. The SBA has gotten slammed with the number of applications. You can look at the number of people that are before you based upon your number when you apply. I know last week they were at like 380,000. Monday of last week they were at 100,000. So they're getting that many in two days. I don't know where they are now. What they have said, they are no longer going to give $10,000 to each one. I don't know whether they ever did. They're giving it on a per employee basis. If you have no employees, then they're giving you $1,000 as an independent contractor. If you have employees, they're giving you 1,000 per employees up to 10 and nothing more that's on the grant, that's not on the loan. Remember, if you get a grant, that's part of the loan repayment. If you're getting the emergency injury disaster loan, you have to take that off of your uh, PPP. You don't get free money on two sides, you only get it on one. I think that covers everything that was on the slide I didn't put on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that was really helpful, thank you. <laughs> that's great. Um, that wrap it up? That's all the questions that I see at the moment. All right. Hey, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. We really appreciate you being here. A special thanks to uh, Muncie, and who may have already signed off. Uh, John Caldwell, Michelle Stevens, uh, Joe and John Petrov, we really appreciate you guys being on here. Joe Bon Jovi. Uh, Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thanks for inviting us. Have you all. I want to mention one last thing. Um, we got a big boost last week when we talked with Katie Adams, the executive director of Kentucky Sherm, and she was able to uh, give us a certification credit for each of these calls. So we sent that out to folks that participated and signed up this week, but we're gonna get it out to everybody that did it in other weeks too. Um, pretty nice right now to get an extra two hours or eight hours um, for certification credit for Sherm and um, so uh, it's for SHRM and HRCI. So uh, we hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, we had another slide on here we were gonna cover, but I think we, we're about out of town. What, a, what about this last slide on the three C's? Yeah, so it was um, a really quick recap of some of the things that have been talked about as well as a couple of additions. Um, so just reminding people of how key communication is and sending out memos a lot of people are doing it weekly i know michelle who talked about some of the communication they're doing sometimes daily i'm um, just keeping people positive and keeping them up to speed on what's being done and how they're being um, protected a frequently asked question sheet is something that's coming really handy at one of my client sites so we just made sure every single employee got it and it's easily available and we update it as needed um, just reminding them why they're why the business is even still open what's being done to protect them um, what their options are in case work is not available. Uh, by now, you'd think most people would be aware, but having a nice little list that says, you know, you could use PTO, unemployment, you might be eligible for SSR, FSBRA leave. I'm just kind of listing all their options there makes them feel a little bit more secure. Um, and then communicating the business steps taken. So, of course, you'll want to communicate at the level that's um, normal for your business, but we do have a couple businesses who are being very transparent with their employees and saying, listen, we're we, you've taken a pay cut or we laid people off, but we've applied for this paycheck protection, and our hope is if we get it that we can bring everybody back or that we can at least do X, Y, Z over the next few weeks. So something to make sure that they feel like they're in the loop and they're not just kind of in a, a vortex of uncertainty. And then a lot of companies, I'm sure, have already done some things to cut costs, but some kind of easy ways that we've seen 
um, retirement and benefit matching reductions. So just reducing or stopping temporarily uh, retirement matches, reducing any benefits that employees aren't really utilizing a lot of anyway. Um, pay cuts, those aren't necessarily easy, but some people have done it either across the board to all of their staff to spread out the pain, or some members of leadership have taken pay cuts very strategically to help fund payroll costs for other employees. Um, suspending your merit and performance, I think that's probably happening whether people want that to or not, just because the pool isn't necessarily there. And then staggering schedules. So not only does that help people physically stay separate if you do still have employees that have to come into the office, but in theory, it could also uh, save you some, some money depending on how you stagger that um, and, and reducing some people's hours so they can utilize the work share. And then challenges. So we talked briefly about managing employees who might be high risk, um, especially in this moment, employees who you know are high risk but are still insisting on coming in or being treated like the other employees. So um, I know one of our speakers had mentioned a waiver. Um, we've, we've had a lot of communication that's been written as well with people that we know that may have an issue that probably should stay home but don't want to. I'm um, just making it very clear that we are trying to offer them the option. Um, Jim, what would you, do you have any suggestions on how to button that up as much as, <laughs> as, much as we can? I can't hear you. I said, I don't know that we can cover that in three minutes. <laughs> that might be a topic for next week if we're going to do this again. <laughs> Perfect. So that, oh. go ahead, Allison, anything else? Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, paid time off. So people are just trying to go ahead and plan for workforces that are going to be able to return and they expect to be able to reopen at full capacity. If their people are going to be totally out of PTO, how are they planning to handle that? Um, so that people do still get some time off. So just thinking ahead. And then healthcare renewals and potential cost increases. Um, a lot of people might not be on a cycle that they're going to see a renewal soon, but for those that are, just be mindful that there's a good chance that all of this that's happening is going to be reflected in the renewal cost. Um, the the healthcare, healthcare costs are skyrocketing across the board, so it's probably not going to be pretty. All right. Good little summary at the end. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, if there are no further questions, we'll wrap up. Thank you all for joining us. We want, we're willing to do this again next week. Um, we'd love to uh, hear from you. If you have questions or other things you need to cover, we'll do it. We don't want to do this just for fun, although it is kind of fun. Uh, we want to do it because it's valuable for you. So if you want us to do this again, we kind of been making a week by week decision. Uh, we continue to get a good number of people on the call. So um, if you want us to do this again, let us know what your questions are. We will get um, these slides out to you and some summary information. So, hey, Lyle, uh, I, have a I have a suggestion. All right, let's hear it, Jim. They could, if anybody knows how to raise their hand, they could raise their hands if they think we ought to do it again. There's a button on there for people to raise their hand. If you don't want us to do it again, you can leave the meeting. That's the, that's the reaction button, right? Yeah. The reaction button. All right. If you want us to do this again, just hit that reaction button and let us know. I mean, it, that way we can keep track of the reactions. We've got about two minutes. We didn't have any questions out there. I know we've lost some people already, but I'm seeing a lot of hands going up. So, but that way we know kind of what you're thinking. Uh, if it's not a benefit, we don't do it. If people get SHRM out of this, the credits and the information, we'll keep doing it. You can do the thumbs up there or the, or the hand clap either. And um, good idea. And then you can go ahead and close out. I just thought we'd do that before people started to disconnect or uh, anything else. Okay. That's it. Let's wrap it up. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a great week and uh, let's make the best of it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you.